Well, good evening and welcome back to our Bible survey class. Tonight we will be in the book of John, the letter of John, the gospel of John, the writing of John, whatever you want to call it, but we'll be in John. So let's pray and then we'll get into our study. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity that we have to meet here tonight. And we gather here, Lord God, in, in this location in the name of Jesus to, to worship you. And we worship by opening our minds and our hearts to receive that which you would have us to learn tonight. We thank you, Father, for this letter, this letter that speaks of the deity of you. So we thank you, Father, and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here we are in this wonderful book or letter that we call John. Now, of course, I don't think I need to tell you, but I will. The, the author of this letter is John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. That is how John refers to himself. John was one of the inner three. You remember the inner three consisted of Peter, James, and John. Now, John was the only one that was standing by Jesus' side at the crucifixion. Many commentators tell us that he, were, he was perhaps the youngest of the disciples. Now, John wrote more than just this letter that we know as John. He wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation. Now, let's do a, a quick review, and if you want to shout it out, that's fine. Matthew, who wrote Matthew, his audience, his primary audience was whom? Jews, to the Jewish people. So keep in mind that when Matthew was writing, he had a particular audience in mind, and he, he wrote in such a way to impact them about the king and the coming kingdom. Next, we had Mark. Now, the author of Mark was John Mark. And do you remember who John primary audience was to the Romans so again when you read through Mark understand that his target he's going to write intentionally to reach his target audience then last week Scott did a wonderful job walking you through Luke now there were some very unique things about Luke Luke was a doctor Luke was also a historian but Luke wrote his letter to what audience? You remember? The Gentiles. Now John, John's writing is known as John was writing to the world. John was writing to the world. If you know someone that's not a believer, that's wanting to discover uh, God, uh, Jesus, what this is about, what the church is about, then I highly recommend that you have them read John. Don't have them start in Genesis, for heaven's sakes. They'll never get there. Have them start in John, because John writes to the world. As a matter of fact, John uses the word world more in the, his writings than all the others combined. So John was writing to the world. And the key word in this letter of John, the key word is believe. Believe. Now, in the Greek, the word believe pastuo means more than just to make a um, a cognitive uh, decision 
like it, tonight when we get ready to leave I believe that when I flip that switch the lights are going to go out you believe when you get in your car and turn the key it's going to start it's also it carries an element of trust now unlike our vehicles Jesus never lets us down okay Jesus never lets us down as a matter of fact the word believe is found in this letter of John over 90 times 90 over 90 times John uses this word believe now the theme of John's writing is that Jesus is the eternal Son of God we know when we studied Matthew that's where we find Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ the Son of the living God John again John's intent writing to the world is to present that Jesus is the eternal Son of God and this gospel is filled with personal interviews and miracles that emphasize the deity and sonship of Jesus over 30 times in this book Jesus refers to God as my father now understand to the Jewish people they couldn't comprehend that we saw that in in Matthew where Jesus is trying to teach the disciples how to pray our father who art in heaven that blew their mind you know you don't refer to God as father so John is using this to help build relationship a relationship the book of John is the revelation of the great I am in Exodus chapter 3 if we went all the way back to Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 we discover where Moses is standing before the burning bush burning bush and says who are you some translation says who are you some translations say who you might be I am and so John is setting out to reveal to the world that Jesus is the great I am and so to stress the deity of Jesus John uses seven I am's statements listed in his writing let me give them to you um, if you're not familiar with them I would recommend you go through and you read them and you study them very interesting all right the first one is found in John chapter 6 verse 35 John chapter 6 verse 35 there Jesus says I am the bread of life now I gave you that one the second one we'll find in chapter 8 verse 12 I want to give you time to look there and I want you to see if you can find the next I am statement chapter 8 verse 12 there you discover that Jesus says I am the light of the world now the third one we find in chapter 8 verse 58 now this is a very interesting statement and it's kind of hard for us to comprehend to understand what Jesus is saying here but in verse 58 we see Jesus says I am and then he follows it with this statement before born he was born before Abraham before Abraham I am now I want to camp out here just for a moment because you'll you will meet people if you haven't already met people as you're as you're sharing your faith there will be people who will say well Jesus never claimed to be God this is really big in the in the Muslim community 
if you ever meet a Muslim and you start talking to them about their faith, they will say, Jesus, Jesus never said he was God. My friends, you need to turn to John chapter 8, 58, and let them read that for themselves. Because even the Muslims know what I am means and stands for. The next one we find is in chapter 10. Chapter 10 in verse 11. Chapter 10, verse 11. There we see this wonderful statement that Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Now, in, in order to fully understand what Jesus is meaning there, you really need to do a study on what a shepherd is. Because so many times we don't fully understand what a shepherd is, nor do we understand what he does for his sheep. So that's a wonderful study. The next one is found in chapter 11. It's one of the most popular ones. Chapter 11, verse 25. That's known as the story of Lazarus. And there you will see Jesus talking to uh, Mary and Martha. And there Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. In chapter 14, verse 6, we see where Jesus makes a very definitive statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except through me. And then the last one, which is actually one of my favorite passages found in this wonderful letter of John, is found in chapter 15. Chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine. That is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful study uh, that, again, I would just recommend you all get into that and just, just study that. Now, I will tell you, um, there's some garbage out there. If you get on the Internet and you start searching, there's some garbage out there, so just be careful. But there's some really, really, really good stuff. Uh, looking at Jesus being the true vine, um, I had to write a paper for one of my one of my classes. Uh, that was my subject that I chose: uh, Jesus being the true vine. And um, I bought like 15 books and read them and studied them. And I'm telling you, it really impacted my life. So I, I'd recommend that you do the same. So what about the outline of the book? Basically, the beginning of the outline is found in chapter 1, verse 1 through 18. And there we see basically just an introduction. The second uh, part is we see Christ's public ministry. And this begins in chapter 1, verse 19, and goes all the way to chapter 12, verse 50. The third section of this letter we discover it begins in, in chapter 13, and it's dealing with Christ's last evening with the disciples. And that goes all the way to chapter 17. Chapters 18 through 20 is our next section. <coughs> Excuse me. And there we find Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection. And, of course, chapter 21 is the finale. So let's begin at the beginning, shall we? So if you will grab your Bible, open it to chapter 1. We're going to read the first several verses here in chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. 
In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Even to those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and, and cried out, saying, This was he whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I. For he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. All right. So here in this sec section, this introduction, so to speak, reveals the purpose of John's writing. Now, as I stated earlier, each gospel writer began his book in such a manner that was suitable for his audience. And they all started at a particular place with a particular reason for a particular point. And so John, unlike the others, goes all the way back to the very beginning of time and actually prior to the beginning of time. Now, Matthew and Luke describe the coming of the Messiah from a human perspective, but John describes it from a divine perspective. He traces the pre-existence of Jesus with the Father from before the world began up to the point of, his, of him becoming flesh. We see this played out here in verse 14. Now, with amazing simplicity, John tells us of the pre-existent Son of God. And in these short verses, <coughs> John declares that Jesus is the most perfect and complete expression of God we can ever know. That's why he says down here at the bottom, the law was given through Moses, grace and truth was realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has <coughs> explained him. So, now I, I, I want to kind of dismiss a myth, if I may, in the fact that, first of all, I want you all to focus on verse 12 of chapter 1. Verse 12 there of chapter 1. And there we see, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Okay? Now, that word receive is an interesting word. In the Greek, 
The word is lasmo or lasma, and it means to acquire a gift. It also means to, listen closely, to assimilate through the mind or senses. Now we know the word assimilate means simply to become like. It also carries this concept of to take hold with hand, to lay hold of it, to admit, to receive it, to receive what is offered, to get to know, to get, to gain, to obtain, and to give back. Interesting, isn't it? So if you come to Jesus and you receive him, you take hold of him, you come to an understanding of who he is and you assimilate him in your life, then you become a child of God. Any questions over the first section? All right, let's move on to section two. Here we see the public ministry of Jesus. Now, again, this begins in verse 19. <coughs> Excuse me. And goes all the way through chapter 12, verse 50. Now, in this section, join... John, excuse me, John points out a particular eyewitness here. His name is John as well. I call him John the Immerser, or John the Baptizer, or John the Forerunner of the coming Messiah. Now, this is just a side note, no extra cost. And there would be no test except for maybe one or two people. But did you notice in chapter 1, as I read through, he talked, John writes that there was, in verse 15, John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Now, I want to challenge your thinking here tonight. Physically, who was born first? John or Jesus? John. So then, John cannot be talking when he says this, that he, referring to Jesus, existed before I... He cannot be talking about a physical birth, can he? Keep that in mind as you study this wonderful letter of John. Here we see John the Immerser deliberately turning his own disciples to Jesus. John was a teacher. Now, he's not referred to as a quote-unquote rabbi, but John was a rabbi because a rabbi is simply a teacher. And John had many disciples. But this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and John deliberately introduces his own disciples to Jesus. Now, John, the one that Jesus loved, he writes about some miracles. But he uses a particular phrasing to state that these miracles that Jesus performed were signs. Signs. In other words, Jesus performed these miracles to present to the world who he is and where he came from. There are many things in life that we see, either see, we may experience, that we call miracles. And many of the things that we call miracles 
are really not miracles. Let me give you an example. When Rhonda went into labor for, with Christopher, I was ready to go. I got to go in, and not only was I able to stand there and watch my son be born, I was able to cut the cord. Now, many people would say, wow, that's a, that's a miracle. A birth is a miracle. Well, the reality is, no. It's a natural occurrence that happens, and you all know how it happens, all right? But it is something spectacular, isn't it? Many times there's been things that's happened in my life, and I'm sure in your life and many others' lives, that we can't explain, and we often say, well, that was a miracle. Well, most of the time, those were not really miracles. That's called, biblically, it's called the providential hand of God. Now, to us, it may seem like a miracle. To many people, including Rhonda and I, uh, when Christopher had his wreck and we were told that he would not live, and he did, and he took after his mother and is just as ornery now as ever. But to many people, they said that was a miracle. That was a miracle. Christopher had, at the scene of the accident, when they flew in Lifeline to transport him out, there's a criteria that you must meet in order to be flown. You must have a pulse. You must be breathing. Christopher had neither. So technically, he shouldn't have been flown. But because of God's intervention, and his divine hand when the nurse got off the helicopter and ran to the fire department the EMTs and said does he have a pulse is he breathing they all looked at her she took her stethoscope off and said we're going my point is simply this God works in some really magnificent ways that we can't explain but technically they're not miracles it's just God working so I kind of get concerned and here's why I know so many people that will say oh that was a miracle you know they didn't they didn't fall down the steps oh that was a miracle no, that was you being awake and paying attention. You know, you all know what I'm, I'm getting at. So just be careful because all biblical miracles serve two purposes. To verify the message, to verify the messenger, and that is exactly what John is writing. He calls them signs to prove that Jesus was and is the divine Son of God. All right, quiz time. Shout it out if you know it. If you don't know it, uh, you'll know it when everybody else shouts it out, okay? What was the first miracle recorded in the letter of John that Jesus performed? Water into wine. Should have known. I can't say this, but a former Catholic said that right off the bat. That's, excuse me, but that's true. He did. Water. Water took water no this is water this is this is just water but jesus turned water into wine at that moment in time the disciples were convinced even though as we read through we see they have a lot of doubt but they were convinced that there was something special perhaps even divine about jesus this was their first glimpse of his deity then we see Jesus cleansing the temple which is also a sign 
that he came to cleanse or correct the religion of the Jews. Now, please keep in mind, by this point in time, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were no longer religious, holy people. They were bloodthirsty, power-driven, angry men and women. And Jesus came to correct. In chapter 3, we have a wonderful encounter of Nick at night. A man named Nicodemus, who happened to be a Pharisee, came to Jesus at night. Now, Nicodemus, listen closely, Nicodemus knew the scriptures, the Old Testament, because the New Testament hadn't been written yet. Nicodemus knew the scriptures. He knew the writings of the prophets. He knew the promise of a coming Messiah. Yet he stood before Jesus and recognized him as a great teacher, but not as a savior of the world. Now, um, spoiler alert, later on we see where Nicodemus does come and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's no extra charge on that either. Well, maybe I should. Anyway, here we go. Jesus tries to explain to him that salvation does not come from the works of the flesh <coughs> but is a free gift from God in chapter 4 we find Jesus at the well talking to a Samaritan woman now according to Jewish customs that's two strikes against Jesus right there he's talking to a woman Understand that was forbidden in this time period. Any good rabbi would never address a woman by himself, let alone go into Samaria. You see, to the Jews, Samaria was unclean. And if they went through, if they even walked through the country, they themselves would become defiled. That, my friends, is called legalism. They have not come to understand God's grace, God's forgiveness. The Jews bitterly hated the Samaritans. Now, the crazy thing is this hatred began 700 years before this. You'll read about it in 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 6 through 8, as well as verse 24. You see, the Samaritans were descendants of Jews uh, from the northern kingdom who intermarried with non-Jews. And to the Jewish legalist, this was an unforgivable sin. Isn't that sad to think that they had that mindset? To me it is. And later on, when the Jews of the southern kingdom were rebuilding the temple, many Samaritans went to them seeking to help out. And they were basically told, we don't want you. You're not welcome here. Go home. Again, think about that. How wicked that truly is and from many I have read that still is taking place today but Jesus did not show any prejudice 
whatsoever. He went to Samaria instead of going around it, showing that God had favor not only on the Jews or the Samaritans, but to all class of people. In chapters 5 and 6, records miracles of Jesus, the healing of the crippled man at the pool of Bethsaida, as well as the feeding of the 5,000. But there's something that happened. <coughs> the, the smell in the air changed shortly after the feeding of the 5,000. In chapter 6, verse 15, we discover where the people made a decision to take Jesus by siege and make him their earthly king. Now, in verse 26 and 27, we find that Jesus was very displeased. And he was displeased because, number one, they did not understand it was not his time to bring in his kingdom. And number two, his kingdom is not on this earth. In John chapter 6, verse 31 through 63... Jesus tells the multitude that they cannot follow him for simply for the physical benefits. Turn with me to John chapter 6. Again, one of my, one of my favorite passages here. Because in John chapter 6, you will find the Antichrist. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove it to you. In John chapter 6, we're going to find, you're going to leave here tonight knowing who the Antichrist is. So let me set the stage. Here in John chapter 6, Jesus is doing some really cool things. And the people were just excited. They were following this concert that Jesus was performing everywhere he went. People being healed, really cool things happening. And they were all excited. They were all emotionally ramped up and charged. And Jesus... Well, let's just pick up verse 59, chapter 6. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, Oh, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, Does this cause you to, to stumble? <coughs> Excuse me. What then if you see the Son of Man as ascending to where he was before? It was the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who did do not believe. For Jesus knew the, from the beginning who they were. Who did not believe and who it was that would betray him so now let me stop for a minute so he's talking about two separate one's an individual one's a group the individual that betrayed him was whom Judas Iscariot but the ones that did not believe the multitude of people that did not believe they were following him for the show. They were following him for the excitement. They were following him, a friend, of, a friend of mine preached, they were only following him for the bread and fish. Let's keep reading. Let's pick up verse 65. And he was saying, for this reason I have said to you, that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. Now here's the Antichrist, John 6, verse 66. 
here it is as a result of this many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore who's the antichrist those who do not walk with Jesus it's not an individual it's people groups all right <coughs> so here we are Jesus is telling the multitude that you can't follow me just for what you get out of me physically you need to follow me for what you can receive spiritually in other words they were not following Jesus for spiritual reasons they were only following Jesus for what they could receive in earthly benefit now there's a bad teaching let me take just a second here and then I'm going to move on quickly um, there, there's a bad teaching here about Jesus statement for this reason I have said to you that no one comes to me unless it has been granted him from the Father I think the King James says drawn drawn to him what that means in, in the Greek what it means and we misunderstand here again okay it doesn't mean that God just selects certain people God calls everybody we already talked about it, right he calls the, he calls the Samaritans as much as he does the Jews he calls the Gentiles as much as he does the Jews God calls everyone. He wants no one to, to, uh, to, to live in damnation, but to all come to him. What that phrase means is Jesus says, those who understand their spiritual need, uh, those are the ones that will draw near to the Father. He also tells them in this part, his plan and his purpose that he must ascend back to where he was before. And as I shared with you, in here in chapter six, verse 66, we discover many left him. Now chapter seven to nine shows the increasing conflict of Jesus with the Jewish leaders. The healing of the blind man in chapter nine created a huge ruckus. They kicked him out, not Jesus the blind man. He was no longer allowed to be enter. He was no longer allowed to enter the synagogue. And after this incident, Jesus Gary gave his great discourse, discourse, excuse me, on the good shepherd in chapter 10. Then we move to chapter 11. Chapter 11, we see the raising of Lazarus. And this is the last sign that John gives in his writings. Now, the other Gospels record Jesus raising uh, someone from the dead, but never had that person been dead for days. No matter what you think about the King James, that section is my favorite in the King James when they say, when Jesus says, roll back the stone, you remember what they said? But Lord, he stinketh. I love that phrase. He stinketh. Four days. Four days. The miracle has such an effect on the people <coughs> that the Jewish leaders wanted to put both Lazarus and Jesus to death. They wanted to kill him right there on the spot. Chapter 12, verse 10. And this section ends with Jesus entering Jerusalem, what we know as the triumphant entry, which ended his public ministry. All right, any questions over that section? All right, pick it up in chapter 13 through verse uh, chapter 17. This is Jesus' last evening with his disciples. In chapter 13, we see where the disciples begin to argue who's the greatest. <laughs> ah. 
But here in John chapter 13, Jesus does something to demonstrate who the greatest in the kingdom is. There he humbly washed their feet to show them humility, humbleness. And there in that passage, he expressed to them that we, as followers of Christ, must be servants. In chapter 14, um, Jesus talks about faith in God. And he talks about the comfort. And he gives comfort to those who are there in the upper room. John chapter 14, uh, if, you, if you haven't memorized any passages ever or are new to it, I'm going to recommend that you read, memorize John chapter 14, 1 through 6. Especially the first few words because you will need them in your life. There Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Very, very powerful. Chapter 14, Jesus begins to introduce to his disciples the Comforter, who is the Holy Spirit. Now, In chapter 15, verse 4 through 6, Jesus drives home this understanding that the Holy Spirit is the comforter. But in chapter 16, he reveals that by him going away and the coming of the Holy Spirit is better for them as well as us that he goes and sends the Holy Spirit <coughs> now in chapter 16 verses 8 through 14 Jesus tells us the purpose of the Holy Spirit now before we list these four things understand that there are many people today that says that the Holy Spirit came for more than these reasons but I'm going to stand on the words of Jesus that the Holy Spirit came for these four things in verse 8 we discover to can convict the world of sin to convict the world of sin. In verse 13a, the first section of verse 13, to guide the disciples, the apostles, those who were with Jesus, into the truth. And in verse 13, the second section, 13b, some Bibles are broken into that way. Disclose what is to come and to speak on behalf of the Father. Disclose, to disclose to the world what is to come and speak on behalf of the Father. And then in verse 14, to bring glory to Christ. To bring, to bring glory to Jesus. Those, my friends, are the four things that the Holy Spirit does. Convict the world of sin. I'm glad he convicted me many years ago. I'm glad he guided the apostles into the truth so that they could pen the New Testament. I'm glad that he was able, through the Holy Spirit, to disclose to them and speak on behalf of the Father. And the last is that they brought glory to Christ. Any questions over that section? Clear as mud? 
All right. Now we get into the part that we don't like to read about. Christ's suffering, death. But wait a minute, we do. We do want to read about the resurrection. If you have never seen the movie, The Passion of the Christ, you must watch it. Don't turn it off. Don't hide your face when it starts getting almost unbearable. We watch it because the best is coming. This section tells us of the betrayal, the trials, the scourging, and the crucifixion of Jesus. And none of this did Jesus himself try to avoid or delay. Jesus was obedient to the death, even death on the cross, Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. For more than three years, a little over three and a half, depends on how you do the math, these men walked with Jesus every day. They ate with him. They prayed with him. They did life together with him for more than three years. But it was only John who stood by the cross. All the others deserted him. So Jesus' death did not only involve physical pain, but I don't know for sure because it's not truly written in the scriptures. But do you think Jesus experienced mental and emotional pain as he saw his other disciples depart? I do. But little did they know that even after they killed him, just a few days later, three, that Jesus would be back to encourage them to believe upon him. Chapter 21 is the finale. Here Jesus appears after his resurrection to help his disciples to basically regain their faith. Chapter 21, beginning of verse 1. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Canaan in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and the two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Yea, Ra, Peter, go, man. They said to him, we will also come with you. They went out and got into the boat and that night they caught nothing. Now, before I read any farther, put yourself in their shoes. To the best of your ability, feel the pain that they're feeling. Understand the imp emptiness that had to be within them. But they thought he was the Messiah. And now he's dead. Verse 4. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, look at the words, look at the words Jesus chose to say. Children, you do not have any fish, do you? Like Jesus didn't know, right? 
They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. Sound familiar? Somewhere before we've read that. So they cast, and they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, look closely, it is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that, it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire. Now think, now place yourself in their shoes. That's the way you get, you understand the scriptures. They saw a charcoal fire. What was Jesus doing? He was having a fish fry. I'm telling you, our Lord, the banquet will be a fish fry when we all get the glory. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Look what he said. Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Here's what I want us to see, and here's what I want us to close on. Even when the disciples turned their back on Jesus, Jesus did not turn his back on them. So look with me in verse 21. So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I want him to remain until now, until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Jesus wants them as well as us today to follow him. Any quick questions? We actually got about two minutes. Well, if you have a question and you don't want to ask it while we are recording, I'll hang around a few moments and uh, answer any questions that you may have. So thank you all for coming. Uh, stay warm. Stay healthy. And Lord willing, unless Jesus returns, we will see you this Lord's Day Sunday morning. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we again thank you so much for this day. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity that we had to come here tonight to get into your word. And, Father, we pray that as we read, as we study, that you would continue to reveal yourself to us. Not only the mighty deeds that you have done, but the great love that you have to offer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.